Okay, so it's five past. Uh, the number of participants the number of participants leveled up for some time. So I think we can start. Mariana, who is uh, I guess a postdoc, right? You are a postdoc at Imperial. Yeah. So will tell us everything about how to recover conservative potential from scattering amplitude when a Galileo is involved in the process. Please. So you have. Uh, I will give you warning at uh, 40, 45, and then at 50 you are supposed to wrap up and leave the floor to, to discussion. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for the opportunity to give this talk. And indeed, I'm going to tell you about how to use these uh, new methods for using scattering amplitudes to compute conservative potentials, and of course, also scattering angles. And this is going to be for a system of um, two particles that have a conformal coupling to Galileans. So this is going to be basically like a proof of principle that these techniques apply broader, in a broader sense. And it's work in progress with Claudia de Ram and Andrew Tolley. So the outline of my talk basically is going to be the following. I'll start giving you a little bit of motivation, although everyone that's been at the workshop already probably doesn't know, doesn't need the motivation for this part, that we know that the very interesting detections of binary systems of black holes can help us prove a lot of new physics. But I'll focus maybe a little bit more on the part of going beyond the R, which um, hasn't been really talked about much in this workshop. And why is it interesting? And how can we start thinking about this part and why we require screening mechanisms in a lot of cases? Then I'll move on and talk a little bit about a short review of the how to obtain from scattering amplitudes the conservative potential. I'm going to focus only on the conservative part here and how you can also match besides to just an EFT for these particles that are interacting through the gravitons. And you can also match it to a point particle EFT. And in the gravitational case, in that way, you can recover basically the metric for your black holes, either for Schwarzschild or Kerr, this has been shown. Now, after doing a short review of the gravitational case, I'll mention how to do this now when you have a cubic Galileo with a conformal coupling. And basically you will follow the same procedure and it's almost straightforward besides for the fact that there's a subtle fee for conformal couplings and the matching is not completely straightforward. You have to be more careful when doing this. And at the end, I just present the results for the scattering angle. And of course, please interrupt me if you have any questions at any time. So let me start now with the motivation. So as we've seen during this workshop, the training week and the conference, um, the mergers of black holes are very interesting to probe physics and to test GR. In this talk, I'm gonna focus basically on only the part of the spiral where perturbative gravity is, is um, actually valid instead of the merger and the ring down where you actually need more non-perturbative corrections and a full XR result. And since we have seen that this can actually test GR at a very precise level now with all the information that we have, I'll be interesting on knowing, um, can we test beyond DR? But here, I'm not gonna go and include gravity. This is just gonna be a proof of principle for the cubic Galileo, which I will explain in a little bit what a cubic Galileo is. And we're gonna use scattering amplitudes techniques because as we've seen during these workshops, there has been several talks that tell us how you can extract information, the classical information from scattering amplitudes. Okay. So let me move on to the part of why we want to go beyond DR. And for me as a theorist, I believe that any theoretically consistent theory that still matches all the observations should be tested in general. So you should just keep looking for any deviations of our basic theories, that's DR. And the computation should be performed from anything you can do that still with a good theoretical consistency. But maybe for this kind of theories that I'm going to consider, like scalar tensor theories, an interesting um, thing is, or motivation is that the, we have no explanation for dark energy. And as we know, dark energy is basically about 68% of our universe. So it's a component that we will be really interested in knowing what it is. And a long time ago, these scalar tensor theories have already been proposed. And you can think of them simply as 
having this isometric they is also coupled to another extra degree of freedom that's a scalar field for these general lagrangians for example only with um, maximum two derivatives per field you want only two plus one degrees of freedom which means you want to avoid ostrograsky dots and long ago it was shown by Kornelsky what is the general form of these lagrangians which I'm not going to be showing here because it's not relevant. But let me just tell you that um, this is not the most general thing you can have. In fact, people have tried more general things that include higher derivative orders, which in principle you would think they could immediately have ghosts if they have more than two derivatives per field. But it was shown, firstly, for beyond Kordesky theories, that if you have some degeneracy in your Lagrangian, like in the kinetic matrix, this will actually generate constraints that remove this S to a ghost. So, for example, in the Hamiltonian, you have second class constraints and then these rooms, these extra degrees of freedom that are ghostly and your theory is fine. So more generally, there are these, um, those theories that in fact are the most general ones of this kind that can have these properties. So we have a lot of kinds of scalar tensor theories that could also give an explanation for these accelerated expansion. So it's interesting to prove them. But um, of course, if we want to match this to the observation, we have a lot of constraints. So not all these theories will be valid in general. And I'm here, there's a lot of constraints that have been proposed and how to measure them. But here I'm just gonna focus really quickly in two constraints. One of them is solar system tests and the other one will be constraints on the speed of the gravitational waves. So for solar system tests, I'm not gonna go in detail, but i um, just going to mention the basics. And the idea is that in our solar system, we don't see any deviations from GR. And since we don't see deviations from GR, what you want is a screening mechanism for the theories that close to you in the solar system, you don't see this extra field force from the scalar field. But outside of our solar system, you could see modifications over, for example, in less dense regions in our universe, you could see modification and you could see this fifth force appearing. So these theories generally require a screening mechanism to satisfy what is observed in our solar system. So that already constrains these theories because you need to have this. Another interesting one and probably relevant for this workshop is the measurement for the speed of light for gravitational waves. And of course, uh, most people know that the LIGO collaboration has measured in this GW178817, simultaneously with a gamma ray burst. And with these two measurements, with multi measure your astronomy, now we're able to put a bound on what is the speed of the gravitational waves with respect to the speed of light. And basically, this bound tells you that they're exactly the same, kind of. And in principle, one could think that's the end of the story, and then we'll have a pretty strong restriction on our theories. A lot of the theories that I showed you before and all uh, the arbitrary functions that they allow are actually pretty constrained and we will have to go back to the basic theories. But um, I should mention that it's not clear that these constraints apply just the way we think. For example, if these constraints come for a theory that a scalar tensor theory that is supposed to describe dark energy, the energy scales of dark energy are the scales of the accelerated expansion today. So that is our H naught of 10 to the minus 42 GeVs. On the other hand, the scales of the energy measured at LIGO are 10 to the minus 22 GeVs. So that is 20 orders of magnitude difference. And it's not even clear, these are effective field theories, it's not even clear that the effective field theory will still be valid here. So we should be careful actually how we take these constraints. But in principle, if you assume that the constraints are correct, then this will neglect a lot. Will you have to discard a lot of theories. And let me quickly mention, there's also a similar constraint from gravitation now sharing of radiation from looking at ultra high energy cosmic rays that gives a similar bound. And this bound actually comes from these cosmic rays that are 10 to the 10 GeV, so even higher energy. So again, we have the same issue. But for now, let's assume that maybe complicated theories are not allowed, and then we'll want to go back to the basic theories of the scalar tensor theories. And then um, one of the simplest ones would be the Galileon. So let me introduce now what the cubic Galileon is and um, why this one, this theory has screening and a lot of these interesting properties. So basically, 
the Galileans are theories that have this shift symmetry, which is the same as a sublimit. And the shift symmetry is the following here. Their Lagrangians are invariant under this. And we also have that given this shift symmetry, their amplitudes go like B squared, even though this is not a trivial sublimit, because as you can see, not every field has two derivatives. So this is an enhancement of the expected sublimit. <laughs> Besides this special sheet symmetry and sublimits, these Galileans appear in a lot of interesting ways. For example, they can be computed as bending modes of brains, or they appear as the longitudinal mode in massive gravity. And they also appear in the decoupling limit of DGP. So these are very interesting theories with um, interesting properties. Besides this cubic term, there's also a quartic and quintic in four dimensions, which I'm not going to care about here, because again, this is just proof of principle. And I'm going to stay with the simplest theory. And as I mentioned, well, these theories will give rise to screening, but this screening is not understood in any scenario. In fact, it's understood in very few scenarios where you have a high degree of symmetries and also it's usually static. And of course, time dependence will change things. So for example, this graph here, what it shows is what will be the case of a coupling to the trace of the stress energy tensor of a massive point particle at r equals zero. So we will have a massive particle here. So there's gonna be a radius called the Weinstein radius outside of which this just goes like the Coulomb force. Our potential is just the same. You have a fifth force, it's not screened. But inside that radius, it's well known that the profile now behaves like square over r. So the fifth force is now suppressed close to the mass. But yet again, this is a very specific case and it's hard to compute these things in more general scenarios. So now um, let me move on to what is the question for this talk. So the idea is basically can amplitudes methods give new insights on these kind of computations for Galileans? And what we're gonna do, as I said, is test a simple scenario. So we're gonna consider two particles with different masses that interact through a cubic Galileon. So we only have self-interactions that are the cubic ones for this field, but they're gonna be conformally coupled to matter, which is gonna be a non-trivial coupling. And also we're gonna stay with the case of spinless particles. So these particles are just gonna be described by a massive scalar field phi. But before I start um, actually telling you how to do this computation with from scattering amplitudes, let me first review the GR case, which actually there have been several talks in this workshop and during the training week and during the conference about it. But let me just set notation and give you a quick review. And remember, in this case, we're going to consider minimally coupled scalars. So that's going to be the big difference with respect to the case that I'm going to talk about later. OK, so let's start with the review of the gravitational case. So with amplitude methods, besides just being able to compute amplitudes with standard Feynman rules, there's a lot of techniques that we can use to just bootstrap all our amplitudes almost from nothing. In fact, it has been shown that if you just consider three-point amplitudes, for example, the three-point graviton amplitudes and the coupling of the gravitons with your scalars, using unitarity methods like BCFW relations or considering the cuts for loop integrals, you can actually reconstruct all the necessary integrals that you need that will give rise to a classical limit that can then be matched to a potential. So the idea is, oh, and besides, you can also use other techniques from amplitudes, such as the double copy, which allows you to compute the middle amplitudes, which are simpler, and then double copy using the double copy get the gravitational amplitudes. So there are a lot of amplitude methods to get over here, all right, scattering amplitudes. And as we have seen, the hardest part is probably not obtaining the amplitude directly, but doing the loop integrations. And on Tuesday, we had some very nice talks explaining how to do those integrations. So I'm not gonna focus on that part here. Then once you have your amplitudes for your pool theory, you would like to match this to a theory where you have integrated out your gravitons. So basically you just have a theory for your scalar fields here, and then you can, match these two theories and find what would be your potential. 
And here, this Wilson coefficient for this theory, it's easily identified with the potential between your binary. And furthermore, something that hasn't been pointed out that much lately is that you could do another matching. And this matching is to a point particle limit in the, in, uh, the limit where one of the masses is much larger than the other. And in this case, um, you will match now your effective theory over here for your scalars to a point particle that lives in certain space time by looking at the potential generated by both and matching those coefficients. And in fact, this has been done for different black hole space times, including spin. And you can reproduce the metric for these space times by doing all this matching. So it will be interesting to see also in our Galileo case, we're going to see how you can go and reproduce the Galileo field profile by doing this. Okay, so now let me move on to step by step how this works for gravity to set the notation, and then I'll just redo these steps, but now for the Galileo case. So as we have been seeing, let's review the kinematics of these scatterings. So basically the idea is that you have two particles that are scattering, they interact with each other through a graviton and they transfer momentum. Remember we're in the classical limit. So this momentum transfer is Q. It's gonna be much smaller than the external momentum of these particles P and the masses. And <clears throat> this Q is actually inversely proportional to the impact parameter. So we have large impact parameters. Now, if we want to extract the classical physics, one needs to restore your H bars everywhere in your action to actually find how your classical part of the potential looks like. So for gravity, we only have two scales that are relevant, which will be this momentum, which we actually care about the wave number. So we will restore H bar to actually write this in terms of the wave number Q and our Newton constant G, which actually scales like one over h bar when needed. So now you can um, construct two expansion parameters, one that measures the classical nonlinearities and another one that measures quantum corrections. So here the classical nonlinearities are measured by this parameter where h is the gravity perturbation over the Planck mass. So this basically just goes like mgq where this is proportional to the Schwarzschild radius. So you can think of it as RSQ. And goes like H to zero, of course, because it just measures classical nonlinearities. On the other hand, quantum corrections are measured by the ratio of derivatives over the Planck mass. And this goes like Q squared times G. And if you notice, um, these quantum corrections are Q over M smaller than the classical nonlinearity parameter. So any Q over M correction that you get, um, to your classical potential is simply quantum. So by simple dimensional analysis, once you know how these um, parameters grow, you can show that the potential in the gravitational case basically looks like this. It's this leading order term that we all know. And there's also gonna be an expansion on the classical nonlinear part, this MGQ. But here we're also gonna take a non-relativistic limit so there's also expansion over P over M, where this is going to be my non-relativistic limit expansion parameter. Then the next part is to actually compute the scattering amplitudes. And as I said, the hard part here is just doing the loop integration. And we have a lot of talks for this, so I'm just going to be short on this part. Um, this is the method that I've been using, and there's a lot of other methods to also do these computations, but just let me review the one that I've been using also for the Galilean computations. So it's basically to use the method of regions to find um, in which, which loop moment and which region actually contributes to your scattering amplitude, do a non-relativistic expansion of your integrant, and then start neglecting terms that won't contribute to the classical limit, and then you can actually do the integration more easily. And you can also just start looking at the graphs and see how they um, scale with Q and be able to neglect the ones that will contribute or won't contribute to your classical limit. So the different regions that one considers are usually the hard region and the soft regions. For the hard, you just assume that the momentum scales like M and this will be like the sternal momenta. If the loop momenta scales in this way, we won't have any contributions to the classical limit in the conservative case or 
in any case. So we just neglect this one for the loop momenta. So we know that the contribution has to be soft. And then there's this can be divided in different regions, the quantum soft, the potential, and radiation, which just scale in different ways in their time and in their spatial components with the velocity. And remember here, we're taking a non-relativistic limit, so it's much smaller than one. So that's why there's two different regions. Since I'm gonna focus only on the conservative case, I'm just gonna do the integration in this region, the potential region. And as it has been discussed a lot, um, this radiation region can also contribute later, but here I'm gonna take up to two loops and only the conservative part. So again, I just focus on this. And here I'm just showing a um, quick example of how you, want, you will do the counting uh, of how a graph scales with momenta to know if it's classical or not. So here is a very simple one loop triangle graph. And you can just start um, imposing what will be the counting in orders of Q for this graph. For example, we have three Marder vertices here. So this contributes with these factors of the mass. Then we have a graviton propagator. We have two of them. So they go just like one over Q. Remember, they're gonna be potential. Then we have matter propagators. We just have one of them over here. So that basically goes like P dot Q, which then goes like one over MQ. And we also have one loop integral. So that's a Q to the four. At the end, our result is basically this, which um, multiplies the leading order. That's a GMQ, which means it's the 2 p.m. contribution. And it's uh, thanks to this matter propagator, it has the non-analyticity that we're looking for that gives rise to the classical physics. Now, this is the simplest case. If you start including box graphs, you will find that there's also terms that go like one over h bar. They can also be multiplied by things that are quantum and then can look classical. But actually looking at the scaling in B will help you to distinguish between those, but I'm not gonna go into detail into that since there's been talks that have already explained this more carefully. Okay, so once you do the integration and you have your amplitudes, the next thing to do is just to do the matching to the effective field view. Um, again, here I'm considering their non-relativistic limit. Of course, my amplitudes are on shell. And the only subtlety is that these amplitudes that I have been computing now need to add a non-relativistic normalization because our EFT is for these non-relativistic scalar fields. So basically the idea is match order by order and an expansion in Newton's constant. So at three level, you simply have your T channel, which is gonna be matched just to the three level potential uh, contribution here. But once you go to next leading order, well, you have whatever contributions you have on your um, full theory side, but on the EFT, you're also gonna to have to be careful because now um, there's gonna be loop contributions in your EFT. So if you're gonna extract this potential RG square, it's not gonna be simply the amplitude. It's gonna be the amplitude minus this loop correction of the EFT from the lowest order potential. And now let me also quickly mention that this matching to an EFT is not the only way of extracting the potential. In fact, um, you can also use the Lippmann-Stringer equation, which was used by these people over here in a nice paper, where you can again, um, find a way to extract what is your potential from your scattering amplitudes with these recursive relations. So the Lippmann-Stringer equation basically can be written in the following way, where you can see that the scattering amplitude is given by the potential, but there will be a recursive term order by order given by this extra part. So it has been shown that this is equivalent to the T EFT matching, and it's actually pretty simple to see, for example, at this next to leading order, if we want this potential at order g squared, which will be given by this term in the, in the amplitudes, then this will be equal to the um, scattering amplitude with, each, with its non-relativistic normalization. But then you have to subtract this term, say at order squared, you have this amplitude at order g and this amplitude at order g. This simply is this graph in the EFT. So basically those methods are equivalent. And in every case that we extract the potential, you can just imagine it's being extracted from something like this, 
or the matching of the EFT, whatever it's easier for you to think about. And let me just go to the last step, um, which I find interesting, which is to be able to reproduce the metric of a black hole. So in this step, what we're going to do is now match further to another EFT in the probe particle limit. So we take one of the masses to be very heavy, and we're going to get a result for a potential already in our EFT that we had before. And we're going to try to match that to this theory, where we consider a point particle action with a minimal coupling to gravity. We're going to take this h mu nu and write the an sets given the symmetries of our problem. So for example, if you don't have spin, like in our case, you know there's going to be spherical symmetry. And then you're going to have several coefficients, and you can extract a potential from this action. You match both potentials, and you will match the Wilson coefficients, and you'll be able to reproduce the metric of your black hole. So now we want to do this for the cubic gallium. So maybe I'll stop here for a second in case there's any questions. OK, if there are no questions, maybe I'll move on to explain now what we actually did now for the cubic gallium and what is um, the exact theory that we're considering. So as I said, this is just a proof of principle, and we want to see um, if these methods also work for more general theories. So I'm going to consider this simple action again for the cubic gallium. Note that we have this new scale, this one over lambda cube here. So there's a new scale besides just a gravitational scale. And we're going to first consider a general coupling to matter. So we're going to have our scalar fields that are massive, but they're going to have a coupling here to this a of pi, where this is just a series expansion in g of pi over n Planck. So C1 is just this um, cubic pi, pi squared term. And then C2 is going to be the quartic interaction of pi squared, pi squared. And in fact, I'm going to stop here for this stuff, but you can easily consider higher and higher orders in this case. Excuse me? Oh. Then you, you lose the shift symmetry by doing that? Yes, um, you do, but this is n Planck suppressed. So it's a small breaking. It's a small breaking. And later on, I'll show that um, why I care about this kind of coupling, because it's going to be related to the conformal coupling, and it's related to the conformal coupling that arises, for example, in massive gravity. Okay. But, but yes. But there is no mass term for pi. For pi, no. No mass term. It's going to be, that's actually very important, and it has to be massless because we need those infrared effects, and yeah. It's similar to the gravity case just because it's again interaction through a massless particle. Okay. So, sorry, I intervened rapidly. And lambda is this of the same order of the Planck scale or is it completely? No. Separate? In general, you can think about it completely different. Uh, for actual theories, there's very strong constraints and it will be, yeah, it's not, it's far from the Planck scale. In, in here, just think about it as a completely different scale. That's good enough. So basically, the idea is that you have now, instead of just one expansion parameter, where in gravity you just do your cosmic cosmic expansion, we're going to have two expansion parameters, basically. OK. So basically, now I'm going to reproduce exactly what I've been telling you for gravity, but now for the Galileans case. And as I said, we have two expansion parameters, so we have to be careful with that. And um, let me introduce this special quality, which is the Bernstein radius. I mentioned it at the beginning. Outside of this radius uh, for the static case, is we know that we have screening. Inside of it, we know that we don't have screening. Um, for this case, is we actually have um, time dependence of our problem. It's not clear that this is exactly the radius where that happens, but this is going to be a quantity that it's useful just to rewrite all our equations in. So this Bernstein radius basically goes like 1 over lambda, and it's important that it has a 1 over n Planck hidden here. So I'm going to be expanding in terms of g and this Bernstein radius rv. So when I have quantities of g, they're not strictly just order g. They're also have an extra power of v hidden in rv if there's an rv multiplying them. 
but still I think it, this is the useful way of introducing them. And one should just be careful to remember that there's a G hidden inside. Um, another thing that's important to point out is that just like in gravity, these expansions are only valid outside the Schwarzschild radius. Here, they're only gonna be valid outside the Schwarzschild and the Weinstein radius. We need both of these quantities to be small for our expansion to be consistent. So in this case, now we have again, two parameters that measure the classical nonlinearities and the quantum corrections. So for classical nonlinearities, now this parameter is the following. It has dd pi over this lambda cube. And just like in gravity, this was like Schwarzschild radius times q. Here it's gonna be Weinstein radius times q. So similar kind of story over here. And again, for the quantum corrections, we again have the derivatives over our scale now for, for a problem that's lambda instead of a blank. So this is q squared over lambda squared, which now has a power of h, so it's quantum. And we're gonna be neglecting all of these corrections, which in general, you can just think of anything that appears like q over m or q over lambda will be neglected. So now the shape of our classical potential is the following, which is a little bit more complicated than the gravitational case, just because we have um, two different scales. So Schwarzschild radius times Q, where this is basically, if you want your usual post minkowski expansion. But now we also have the Galilean interactions. So you have an RBO times Q. And this always comes with a power of cube, because remember, this is one over lambda. And in the Lagrangian, this, is, this appears as one over lambda cube. So this always will appear with powers of Q. And just uh, this log Q squared term appears just for even then because if not, there, those will be contact terms after Fourier transformation. So uh, this log Q squares can appear here. So the second step now again is to find what are the classical contributions. And here, as I said, I'm gonna be doing this expansion if under order G and order RV cube. And I'm just gonna show you here what are the graphs of the two loops that give contributions. Basically we have, of course, our standard T channel at three level. We have a triangle graph at one loop and we have a few triangles and the usual H for two loops. Um, let me point out this one doesn't contribute at all at the classical limit. So we basically just have contributions from these two. Um, another important thing to point out is that at the end, when you, if you wanna take a probe particle limit and take one of these masses to be heavier, the only contributions are for these triangles, no contributions from H's or anything else like that. And lastly, one thing that's worth pointing out here is that at this order G, we only have cubic interactions. Notice that all of these are just cubic interactions between um, matter and pion. So it's only terms that go like pi squared pi. Nothing that goes like pi squared pi squared appears at this order. So that's interesting to point out. So if you just have a coupling where you have this term in your A of pi, that expansion, just the C1 and nothing else, this is all that appears. So it's very simple. But if you have actually a term that appears like pi squared pi squared, so a quartic coupling like this one over here, then you have uh, more graphs that contribute and things get, I mean, it's, it's literally the same complication, but just more graphs. If you note, basically these graphs correspond to shrinking one of these vertices down to here. So you just grab one of these points and you shrink it and you obtain all of the graphs that you can see over here. You again, now this is at order G square. And again, it's at each order in G, besides the order in G, you also have an expansion in RV. So at order G square, RV zero, first contribution, G square, RV cube, you have these contributions. And again, to point out that only arise if you have these kind of couplings. And besides these graphs, here you have new terms that are these box graphs or box triangle. These two contain um, super classical terms that I was mentioning that go like one over H. Uh, these actually just cancel when you do the EFT matching. So they're not relevant here as one should expect. This one doesn't have any co classical contribution at all. This one doesn't have classical contributions in the probe particle limit. 
So the next step now, which is the matching. And at order D is actually quite simple because our potential is simply going to be the amplitude. The matching doesn't have any of these extra terms that appear either from the lipman schinger equation, which sometimes is called these form subtraction terms. They, they don't appear because if any time that you're going to do recursions, you already have an order G. So when you do another recursion, you're always going to get order G squared. So here, if you want order G in any order in your Bankstein radius, RPQ, RP6, or as high as you want to go, all you need is the amplitudes. You don't need to do anything else. At the next order, though, you actually have to do the standard procedure of doing the EFT matching, which implies that you have a recursive relation and it's not simply just a straightforward matching between the amplitudes and the potential. But it's interesting My to point out. Yeah. 10 minutes. Okay. That, yeah, you, you have this extra, uh, this simple relation if you only want to consider at this leading order in G. So let me just show you for completeness the result of our conservative potential. And as I said, at leader order in G, we have simply every term comes from the scattering amplitudes from the one loop triangle at RB cube from two loop tri uh, triangles, RB26, and from the H graph where we have RB cube and RB B cube. So this, um, maybe I should point out clearly, this RBA means that uh, the mass that appears over here is the mass of A. If it's RBB, the mass that appears there, it's oops, the mass of the particle B. So we basically have uh, these terms. If you, if you take the limit MA much larger than MB, the only terms that will end up surviving will be the leading ones here and here. All of these are suppressed by the small mass MB, if you want, when you're taking that limit. Another interesting thing to point out here, and that it was actually expected, is that this is not a simple series expansion in just RB. Um, we have this extra energy dependence in this term. And this is expected because the screening shouldn't, it's not a static scenario. The, streeting, the screening shouldn't just simply be determined by the scale RB. It should be also determined by the energies of the particles, by the velocities of the particles. This, as you have mentioned, is in the momentum in the center of mass frame. So this is not a simple expansion in just RB. Notice that if it was only triangle graphs, it would have been. But we also have this H graph that gives you this extra energy dependence that we expect it to be there. We expect um, the exact radius for the screening to be slightly modified by the dynamics of this binary system. And we can see this over here. So at next leading order, we have something slightly more complicated, but again, um, I mean, it's quite straightforward. It's an expansion again, this is order G squared, and then I have expansions in RP. Let me just point out, um, when I put these orange terms over here that depend on this C2, this comes from scattering amplitudes. This C2, if you remember, is the quartic coupling. So the terms that come from, squart from the quartic coupling come from scattering amplitudes. But we also have terms that don't depend on that quartic coupling. It's just the cubic coupling, so this C1. And these are these terms over here. And those come from the EFT matching, or if you want the Born subtraction. So even though the scattering amplitudes in principle didn't give you any extra terms that appear that disorder G square, when you compute the potential, you are gonna find them. You, even if you don't have a quartic coupling, even if you neglect this, you're still gonna have terms at disorder just from the EFT matching. So that's just something interesting to point out. And again, this is not a simple expansion in RV cube. You have extra energy dependence that is just a little complicated functions over here, but it's just to be expected. And finally, and probably um, the most subtle and interesting part is the matching to the point particle action. So in this case, this matching that I'm gonna consider is to 
a very known case and that it's relevant in the literature and is the so-called um, pi p coupling. So here I'm considering a, this general A of pi that I described before and it's coupled to the stress energy tensor of our point particle here and is Planck suppressed. These kind of couplings, for, for example, for the Galileans, they arise in massive gravity uh, when you try to decouple all your modes and you get this kind of coupling here. In general, you can just have a point particle of this form with a conformal coupling. Now this gives you it's actually a squared eta pi. So this is just Minkowski. And even though I'm introducing here a metric, uh, let's remember that I'm neglecting gravity. This is just Minkowski and I'm not gonna add any perturbations. So it's just gonna be a conformal coupling to our Galilean. So we have something slightly more complicated, but then these solutions of this conformal coupling of the cubic Galilean to a massive point particle are known. And here we're gonna consider that we have two particles. One of them is really heavy and one of them is light. So the heavy mass is gonna generate our Galilean profile and the exact solution is known. And here is its solution. It's this screening solution that I was telling you before. So we have here at R equals to zero, our uh, particle with mass MA. And somewhere over here, we have a particle MB. That's very light, so it doesn't really change our profile very much. So we can just write it's Hamiltonian, the full relativistic version, which literally will be this, and plug here what is the pi profile generated by the heavy mass. So then you have the Hamiltonian, you can find your potential and you can match it to your result from amplitudes in this pro particle limit. So now let's look at the amplitude side. So before I told you, I have a coupling over here that was an A M square pi square. This can actually be related to the coefficients of a conformal coupling. So let's consider now this conformal coupling of our massive scalars, but now here they have this conformal metric to this metric G tilde, which is given again the same way as before. And one in principle will say, okay, I'm gonna grab this metric. I'm gonna plug in this G tilde. I get a factor of A to the four here. If I just expand my coefficients, I can match them to what I had before. I also have a factor of A squared here. So it's a derivative coupling. But in the classical limit, those derivative couplings effectively give you a coupling that's actually M because this is a derivative applied on the external fields. So it actually goes like P, our external momentum, which goes like M. So it's basically, it, it, it's just like the coupling we had before. But if we were to just simply grab this action and immediately match our potential to what we had, um, from this known result, we will find that there's a mismatch. And the answer, the x uniforms or un vettore. Lo spostamento. Excuse me? Sorry, no, this is an interference. Oh, it's not, okay. It doesn't belong to us. <laughs> so you have five minutes to wrap up. Yep, that's perfect. Okay, so we need actually to do a be more careful with the matching and match the correct scattering states. So these new fields are actually not the correct scattering states for matching because in your effective field theory for your scalars, you are implicitly assuming that you have a special normalization in the standard way of your scattering states. So, you know, just classical canonical normalization of all your states. And these scattering states are not the same that you just find immediately here. You can think also the same in this um, Lippmann Schunger equation, you are actually writing that potential as a sandwich between these kind of scattering states. Those won't be the states corresponding to this field phi. So instead, before just blindly matching, you actually have to do a field redefinition, which in this case is simply done by this phi tilde over here. And then when you do that field redefinition, you will actually have the correct scattering states to match between your effective field theory and your full theory and back to the point particle and get the correct result. So after doing this field redefinition, 
you're actually going to get several terms that include derivatives and some extra terms that they all vanish in the classical limit. And the only important part will be this part. So the coupling again to the masses. And now it's going to be a pi to the square. So even if you have, a, say, an a pi that goes like 1 plus c1 d pi over m Planck, notice that before what I was doing was a uh, coupling m phi square a. So if I match the coefficients of the c appearing here with the c appearing here, I'm always going to have a quartic coupling because this is squared. So all those terms that I was saying, OK, maybe you don't want to consider them if you consider a simple coupling like this. When you consider that simple coupling, but for a conformally coupled scalar, they're going to appear immediately. So we need to take those into account. So let me wrap up maybe uh, in the last five minutes, we're just showing you the computation for the scattering angle. And again, this is something that has been largely discussed in this workshop. And I'm just going to use results that are very nice from these papers that have been derived at understanding how one can actually use directly the scattering amplitudes and match the scattering amplitudes to the scattering angle. So what we want to consider here again is just two particles in A and B scattering. We have the usual uh, scattering angle over here. This is a large impact parameter. But let's remember we have a large impact parameter and our Bankstein radius should be smaller. And of course, our structure radius will be way smaller than that. Now, we have already our Hamiltonian, so we can just set H to E. And from that, we can obtain the following formula for the momentum squared in terms of the momentum at infinity for these particles. So far from each other over here, these particles will depend. Um, this momentum at infinity will only depend on its energy and its masses. And then it can be written in terms of this sort of effective potential that depends on the energy and the distance. And recently, it has been shown that this actually matches to the scattering amplitude. It's a linear matching, and it's very interesting. And it's only in 4D. It, this is not the case that you have a linear relation in higher dimensions. So it's a very special case. And once you have this, you basically can write anything that was written before in terms of this effective potential now in terms of our classical scattering amplitudes. So we can graph our classical formula for the scattering angle that um, is written in the following way, which was actually derived long ago. And the leading order is just like the iconal approximation and then with some pseudo-iconal ones. And you will see that here, instead of having the potential to the k. In any case, you have the scattering amplitudes. So you can just go straight forward from your scattering amplitudes to your scattering angle. So we did this, and we found the following results. Maybe it's not too enlightening, but uh, I think that's worth mentioning is that um, an accident that usually happens in GR, which is that the leading order term, which is I call in here chi of k1, is actually good enough to describe not only the order g, but also order g squared. This doesn't happen here, that accident, simply because we have, besides just an expansion in g, we have an expansion in rvq. So we have extra terms, again, with rvq. So here, of course, the leading order, just an, a in gr, disappears, but we have an rvq term that comes from this, um, the second leading order in this expansion. And in fact, this term is quite relevant if the Italian interactions are strong and could bring um, your distance of closest approach inside the Bankstein radius, making this calculation not valid. So one has to be careful that this term is not too large because then this calculation is not valid. So let me just um, finish by looking at the probe particle limit. So this is basically the same result as above, but now written in the limit where one of the masses is much larger, MA is much larger. And just specifically written in terms of these variables where this is uh, Schwarzschild radius over your impact parameter, Bankstein radius over your impact parameter, and this is your momentum over infinity over the large mass MA. And what we can see is that in this case, we have a very simple 
expansion in terms of um, epsilon VB, which is in terms of the Feinstein radius over your impact parameter. So all of these expansions, yeah, I mean, compared to the complications above in the particle limit becomes something very simple. And again, we have this term that we would like to not be too large. And we can check, in fact, that if this is satisfied, then our calculation will be valid. And this is quite easy to satisfy, since if you notice, we have here an epsilon dB, which is Schwarzschild radius over impact parameter. This will be a very large distance. And this will always, sorry, very small, so this will always be very large. So we generically expect this to be satisfied and the calculation to be valid. So finally, let me conclude by just mentioning that what we have done here is to show that the amplitude methods can apply beyond minimal coupling. One just have to be careful with the matching when you and consider the correct scattering states when you have these conformal couplings. Besides gravity, this also applies for Galileans and it will be nice to see if it applies in general for uh, more interesting theories. And there are some interesting things that one could be able to look at okay, by adding spin to the particles and seeing um, what are the extra corrections that you see. And if your expansion now only will not only depend on Bayesian radius and energies, but also on the spin. Uh, question is if, if there's any case that resumation is possible, although it looks very hard, but that will be the only way of accessing the screen region in this case. And lastly, maybe you can start adding gravity with in actually consider a full scalar tensor theory. Okay. So that'll be it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. So we have a few minutes for questions. Of course, we have a discussion after the second talk. But if there is any quick question now, I don't see any hand raised. Uh, no. Okay. In the then I will ask a question. Yes, uh, sorry, I, I'm not an expert about uh, strong coupling and Weinstein um, radius, but I tend to remember that it depends on the on the cubic self coupling of the of the pi, right? Or your Galileo. Yes. Whereas, where, whereas I didn't see any lambda in your formula for the for the Weinstein radius. Oh yes, there was. So the Weinstein. Oh, there was, okay. So I it was like it. one over lambda. Sorry if that wasn't completely clear. Let me just go here. No, maybe I just missed. Yeah, every time you see an RV, it's like one over lambda. Ah, one over lambda. Okay, sorry. It's there indeed. Okay. Yeah, I just Thanks. found this uh, more clear to do the expansion because this kind of measures squares the screen and non screen region, although here we slightly modify. Okay. Ah, Carlo, please. Yeah, thank you. And just a very quick related question. So I, I was under the impression, or I remember probably wrong, I don't know, that this Weinstein screening was a purely classical phenomenon, right? So so I was a bit puzzled by this one over each bar precisely in this formula. But maybe I'm wrong again. So please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, this one over h bar appears here just when you literally put back the h bars. But as I said, the the expansion parameter for the classical nonlinearities and where you will actually see the screening, it's this over here. So that's RVQ. So it's actually H to the zero. So when you actually see the, dynamic, the dynamics of the screening, it, this is the relevant parameter more than this one on its own. This one here appears because M Planck, well, you can think of it as square root of G. Square root of G will go like one over H to the half and lambda. Actually, if you bring back the H bars, you will also have like an H bar to the um, five sixth. So this is just actually bringing back all your H's in your Lagrangian. But when you actually consider the classical dynamics, the relevant parameters, which is basically this one for your expansion and what measures when the screening happens has an H bar zero, so it's classical. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ricardo, um, maybe I ask a question. Ricardo, it's okay? See the hand raised by Paolo, sorry. Ah, sorry, okay. Gabriele. Okay. <laughs> but you have to follow the line. Yes, <laughs> First, Paolo. I cannot First Paolo and then Gabriele. Okay, now my, you talk about conformal coupling. Yes. Does it mean that the Lagrangian is conformal invariant? 
And uh, no, so let me go back to the conformal coupling, maybe. So it's, it's this it. Yeah. So this is basically what I'm considering of conformal coupling. Just means that my metric it will be coupled in the following way. In general, if you have an actual scalar tensor theory, this will be just another metric. And this is just a function of your Galilean fields. But you, you don't have to have any conformal invariance here. You can have whatever you want here. OK, no. Thank you. Yeah. Gabriel? Uh, just about the diagrams you drew um, with this dotted line, I didn't understand. Are those all lines are uh, Galileo's lines or? Yes. So why do have mixed uh, you know, coupling of gravitons to, to the Galileo's? I mean, more yeah, I did. the diagrams. I didn't consider that here. That's why I was saying this is just for a proof of principle that it works. It will be interesting to see in the full scalar tensor theory where you could have a coupling of the graviton with the Galileans, and then you'll have a lot of more diagrams. Okay. And um, did, did you consider the Bremsstrahlung of gravitons? I mean, yeah, no, I only stuck here to the uh, conservative part, no radiation. No. So, yeah. You don't know whether this is a danger. No, the, the, no, we haven't looked into much that. Source of energy into those. I mean, I expect that some order it should, um, but yeah, we haven't looked into that. Okay, thank you. So I remind uh, everybody that we have a discussion session after the second talk. So if you have uh, short questions, I will let Donald and then Sebastian, and then we move to the next talk, but only for short questions. Otherwise you will be postponed to the discussion session. So Donald. Okay, yeah, I, I think this is pretty short. Um, maybe it's slightly related to what Gabriele was saying. Um, it seems to me, well, an interesting thing to look at would be the radiation of the, the scalar mode. Yes. Um, so in particular, um, you know, if, you, if you're interested in constraints and something like this, the, you know, a gravitational waveform or something that, that you get that you would detect from this thing, you know, wouldn't necessarily be directly sensitive to the scalar, right? But, it, but the scalar would lead to a change in the frequencies. Yes. So it might lead to, you know, something that would be more constraining. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Thank you. That's it. Okay, Sebastian, and then we move to the next talk. Yes, it's a, it's a simple question about these diagrams you have in your slide. Yeah. It seems you're neglecting C2 squared diagrams. Is that, um, is that correct? Sorry, say that again, I'm neglecting what? Diagrams proportional to C2 squared. For instance, you can have... Um, oh, um, yeah, mostly because either they will appear as bubbles or they appear as higher order in G. So anything that will be order G cube, I'm not considering here. G cube times any expansion in RV. All of those I'm neglecting here. So some could, some of them will appear at that order. And others, I don't know, maybe you're thinking something like this could be, yes. it's, it's quantum. It's quantum, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we thank Mariana again. Thank you.